This being the last in our series of lectures on sacred code, I would like to talk about ornament as a visionary pursuit. And this lecture will be divided in three parts where I'm going to go a bit deeper into the visionary aspect of seeing and seeing with the divine eye. This is a detail from my painting, The Scarabaic Rising of Christ. And I've learned over time as an artist that this fairly conventional image of God as the eye in the triangle is uh, maybe read in a very superficial level as the eye of God, but also has much deeper meanings and intentions behind it. Uh, Ernst Fuchs, H.R. Giger, Alex Gray, they've all called upon that image in their work, all of them being important visionary artists, uh, because I think it resonates deeply with them in different ways. Now, as I said, uh, we don't have to use this image in any kind of obvious or simple, as a simple sign. And over time, I've come to call it the hidden sign of the hieratic in visionary art because I've detected its presence time and again in works of art. And its purpose is to basically underlie the figures and direct your gaze and to direct your gaze to a certain point so that perhaps your gaze will be held on that point and the purpose of a sacred or a visionary work of art is to really reveal the sacred and often through meditation. So if we can fix our eye on a certain point and hold it for meditative purposes. And so if you look at this uh, painting by Ernst Fuchs, here's this figure and he's holding this stick. This is the eye in the egg, an important motif from that period. He called it Behälter des Weltalls, the, uh, the eye that beholds the entire creation or the universe. And then there are various folds and drapery and so on, which strike me as not being uh, totally coincidental. Blake with the eye of, in this case, Job in the halo, and the eye is exactly at the center of the halo, and then his drapery falls in a certain manner as well so that I see this hidden sign of the hieratic in these works and I don't think it's pure coincidence that Ernst Fuchs has created this triangle with this eye at the top. And Blake, perhaps this is more coincidental, but he definitely loves his triangular figures with this eye gazing at the top. Uh, Joffre being an important visionary artist whose work emerged during the 70s uh, as a meta-realist. Uh, perhaps you know his Zodiac series. Uh, Martina Hoffman being another important visionary artist still alive and working today. And again, when you look at these portraits, self-portraits actually, uh, you ask yourself why certain lines are placed the way they are, why her face falls into darkness, for example, on one side. And when we add this hidden sign of the hieratic, we find that somehow all the elements come together in a certain way so as to draw our vision toward that eye. And definitely, in the case of a self-portrait, it's a motif which has existed throughout history. Uh, the Byzantine artists definitely purposely put the eye of the Madonna at the very center of the halo, which itself was at the center of the head as it was turned at a three-quarter angle. But then you get these other elements, like these angels at the bottom, for example, which seem to naturally draw us into this triangular structure. Uh, in the case of Rembrandt, this is uh, Aristotle contemplating a bust of Homer. Uh, what strikes me as interesting with Rembrandt is he's playing with light and darkness. And perhaps the strongest contrast is right there in the eye, where the eye is total black with this spark of light, white, making this contrast that sparks itself to draw your eye to that place. So this is something which 
I myself have been playing with over time, this idea of this structure called the hidden uh, sign of the hieratic. And I ask myself, well, if it's a principle which underlies painting to a large degree, is it also a principle which could possibly underlie the construction of ornament? And why is ornament symmetrical? Why does ornament always seem to move? I mean, granted, plants have that structure, but why does this line move in this serpentine way around this invisible straight line, drawing our eye towards some point at the center? Uh, Ernst Fuchs also asked himself some of those questions. And he wrote about it in Architectura Celestis. And he calls it the dance of the serpentine line around an invisible straight line. He writes, at the time of drawing Job in the Judgment of Paris, which is this one here, we'll have a look, a look in a moment, I had drawn soft architecture, which was dominated by a curving line which searched flexibly in a wave-like dance for the straight line. I recognized the play around of the straight line was the musical, the vibrating principle of the hidden prime of styles. And I've mentioned this before, the hidden prime of styles is that quest for the primordial style which underlies all epochs of history. <clears throat> Uh, when we look at this piece of, this vision of architecture by Ernst Fuchs, you can see that there is perspective, but the perspective line is not drawn. It's invisible. It's an invisible straight line. And this invisible straight line is providing the foundation for the movement of all these other lines. And similarly, this, this uh, serpent column, which is a common motif in Aztec architecture, the serpent column uh, also curves in a serpentine way around the invisible straight line. So, once we get that concept, then we start to ask ourselves, you know, when we're looking at ornament, we're looking at all these beautiful curving lines, but do these curving lines have some deeper purpose? Here's a lotus flower from ancient Egypt, and you have this sun-like palmette emerging from the lotus flower. And any Buddhist could tell you that the sun emerging from the lotus is a symbol of awareness, consciousness, and in fact, a, a, a higher form of awareness, divine consciousness. So that are we, in fact, looking at a design which is trying to remind us in a certain way of how to still ourselves, how to focus ourselves, how to gaze in a meditative way upon a certain sentiment? Not always, but quite often. And so uh, the symmetry that you find in ornament is definitely uh, an important component. But once you've established symmetry, you also want to play with that symmetry in a certain way. Uh, these are typically called the eyes in ornament. These two motifs are the eyes. And yet, if these are indeed the eyes, then any good Hindu or Buddhist would ask, where's the third eye, right? That uh, the third eye is that which exists above the two eyes, which view everything randomly in a distracted way. Uh, that the third eye is the eye which sees everything as stilled, as eternal, as uh, moving with eternal calm. <clears throat> and that's, I think, what we're getting here in these designs. Just to give one more example then of the two eyes with that, so to speak, exploding third eye at the top and uh, the third eye being that which blossoms, that which grows, that which awakens, that which uh, unfolds to new awareness. <clears throat> so I hope whenever you look at a piece of ornament on a building, you ask yourself, is it just a plant? Or is it some kind of visionary plant? A little reminder of how certain plants can allow us to awaken to higher states of consciousness. 
This is uh, a drawing which I made and it took me about five or six years in all, working on and off over a period of time, called Vishnu Christ Avatar, where I was basically trying to uh, fuse two different styles, the Hindu style and the Gothic style that you see in France because I had just returned from a journey to India where I was very much inspired by everything that I'd seen. And it was my chance to, in a certain sense, try to integrate that experience of being plunged into Hindu culture and decipher what I had seen. I interpreted it in a Christian way, quite consciously. So you have Eve and Adam before this kind of visionary tree, what I call the tree of vision, and she's taking the fruit from the tree of vision. And at the bottom left and right, you have these Hindu motifs, which I borrowed quite consciously from Hinduism, of these figures that spew out these uh, vegetation, but it begins as simply a random form. And I began this whole section not knowing what I was going to put. It was just architecture and I was going to fill the architecture with ornament, not knowing where I was going to go. The only thing I knew is that I had these S curves and I had to fulfill the S curves. So this was kind of this randomness, what in Hindu or Sanskrit is called uh, chitta, the mind stuff, the, the, the stuff that's always moving around in your head and assuming a thousand different forms. And for me, it was free to develop into whatever form would eventually uh, manifest itself. So as you can see at the bottom here, that eventually they took quite consciously gothic shapes and forms, as well as these dwarf caryatids you have at the bottom with this uh, image of Christ or Vishnu Christ at the center with eight arms. As I looked at these things and I was working on them and they were very much inspired by different motifs I'd seen in Gothic uh, churches and cathedrals in France, I started to see underlying patterns and shapes and eventually I identified the shape that was recurring again and again and I saw a square with a circle and then quite simply a triangle inscribed in the base of the square. And it's a very logical construction, but once you give yourself that construction, you ask yourself, maybe it does underlie a lot of what we see. By the time I reached the top, and again, this was, uh, I, I worked at it, I changed it numerous times until finally I arrived at this construction where at the left in Sanskrit it says, I give you my divine eye, behold, this is from the Bhagavad Gita, and on the far right in Latin uh, from the book of the Apocalypse, in English, behold, I make all things anew. And at the very top then, this eye. And in fact, when I drew the eye, and this is from the bottom of the sculpture at the very base, I inscribed that as my kind of sign, which I called trimorphic matrix sub oculus, a rather poetic name, but meaning it is a three basic shaped matrix that underlies all of what we see. And, uh, and using that shape, I then constructed this divine eye. This eye which sees, and as it sees, the vision flows forth actively. And it flows forth while we could say there is this other movement, this more serpentine movement, which I interpret as vision and form and the way form flows around our straight lines of vision. And this is now the way I think. Whenever I draw, I think of form as those soft, rounded, liquid, serpentine shapes that move around everything that we see because it's a straight line of vision. 
In the course of my reading, I came across Violette Le Duc, who was responsible for the restoration of a lot of the Gothic cathedrals in France under Napoleon III. And he wrote this long eight volume dictionary of architecture. And in one of the volumes, he talks about style. And he says in French, le style est la manifestation d'un idéal établi sur un principe which is to say style is the manifestation of an ideal founded upon a principle. We could also say that style is the natural consequence of a principle followed methodically. Hence, only one kind of form may emerge naturally without force. If it is forced, it becomes a mannerism. Mannerism grows old, but the style never. And in a certain sense, he's thinking very much like Ernst Fuchs, that there's a certain style which persists through time, a certain style which is founded upon a principle. And the question is, what's the principle? Well, in Gothic, uh, the Gothic style, in Gothic architecture, we can see that you know, the characteristic arch, which is called the Ogival arch in Gothic architecture, and it's immediately recognizable uh, is in fact founded on these invisible lines, the invisible lines being these three circles. And that this circle here gives the center point for this outer circle, which is drawn right here to create uh, what is called the eye or oculus of the arch here. And then that triangular shape. So, all of Gothic art is founded on a principle, a geometrical principle, a hidden geometrical principle. And this is kind of clear. We've seen this example uh, in an earlier lecture where the barbed quatrefoil, which the barb being here, is a typical shape that occurs again and again in the facades and when you create the ornament of a Gothic cathedral, the stonemason was probably following that geometrical structure that goes into the creation of the barbed quatrefoil. And we can see that in these examples, where here he's followed the vertical, here he's followed the circles, rather, and here he's followed the diagonals. And he had a choice to follow, to follow either the straight lines, the curving lines, or the diagonal lines. They were all there in that initial shape or principle that underlies uh, their work. Now let's jump across time and culture to Romeo Schrestra, who is alive today. He uh, has a school of tanka painting. He's originally Nepalese. And this is the top of one of his tanka paintings. The entire painting is down here. I'm not showing it to you. I'm just showing you the ornament at the very top, which is called the uh, Kirti Mukha, the face of glory, which is this uh, a, a long motif, but basically um, it was placed there as this kind of self-devouring face to frighten off anyone who was unprepared to view the work. <clears throat> now, the longer we look at that motif, we can see the serpentine lines, we can see the curves, they're evident, but are there certain invisible lines that are structuring and providing a certain support for those curving lines? And now, when we see this figure here, this serpentine figure, we see that the curves of the serpentine tail and so on it, this is the serpentine line moving around the invisible straight line, exactly as Ernst Fuchs uh, described it. And it seems to be one of those things that goes through history and through the history of ornament in particular. Every great painting probably in history had an armature, but where did painting get armature from? Probably from ornament, that it existed, armature existed in ornament first of all. So, in the second part now, 
uh, if we've established this idea that we are going to see with the divine eye, then we have to change our idea of vision and see vision as the active creation of the cosmos rather than the passive reception of it. And I became intrigued by that idea because I've always felt that vision, especially if you're a visionary artist, is something that's active and that we actively project. Uh, and if we are especially inspired by the all creative eye of the divine, you know, God creates the cosmos by seeing. God actively creates the cosmos by seeing. If we tap into divine sight, then we as visionary artists can also actively create by seeing. So vision becomes active. That's called the extra mission theory of vision when it's active. However, there is also, and I think you know very well, a passive theory of vision, which is called intromission. And I would like to look at the history of this. We today tend to hold a passive or intromission theory of vision, which actually only occurred during the Renaissance. And during the Renaissance, uh, a, a great thinker and artist like Leonardo da Vinci, who was also very one of the first empirical thinkers, he was one of the first people to look at nature and try to learn from nature. So he's one of the first people to passively observe what was in front of him, this scientific standpoint, which, we, which did not really exist during the Middle Ages. Um, he wrote, just as a stone flung into the water becomes the center and cause of many circles, and as sound diffuses itself in circles in the air, so any object placed in the luminous atmosphere diffuses itself in circles and fills the surrounding air with infinite images of itself. And he was really struggling here to come up with this idea that you have an object and this object is actually projecting infinite images of itself in all directions and that when we're looking at it, we are passively receiving one of those images. Now, uh, by the time we get to uh, Sir Isaac Newton, he takes the time to actually write uh, his famous uh, book on optics, where he argues for the first time that, in fact, the sun projects these rays of light onto uh, an image like a man, and that that image enters through the lens of the eye, is inverted, and then that goes through the optic nerve and to the brain. And so vision is this passive reception of what we see. Now again, optics, 1704, this scientific outlook is emerging where we have a passive view of the world. <clears throat> For pretty much 2,500 years before that, from the Greeks all the way through the Middle Ages, the idea, the reigning idea, was the extra mission or active theory of vision. And if you, for example, read Empedocles, who is one of the, we say, pre-Socratic philosophers, one of the five or six philosophers who we still have fragments of what they've written because they were cited by other philosophers before uh, Socrates. We have this one fragment which was preserved by Empedocles, fragment 84. And he writes, as when a man thinking to travel through the stormy night gets ready a lamp, a flame of blazing fire, and puts round it a lantern to keep out all manner of winds, so that, so that light may shine outward and across the threshold with unfailing beams. Even so did she, Aphrodite, create the eye, so as to entrap primeval fire within the round pupil whose gentle membranes and delicate garments are pierced through with wondrous passages. These keep out the water that surrounds the pupil, but let the fire pass through." Now, it's a long passage, but basically what he's saying is that within the eye is this fire, this fire of vision, which 
uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, who holds all things together, she sparked the fire in the eye. And through this fire, light moves through the watery membranes of the eye and passes outward. And that's how we see. We see because we're projecting vision. Uh, now, about a hundred years later, Plato is talking about vision as well. And he talks about something called the intraocular fire, which is again, this idea that there's a fire in the eye. Such a fire as has the property not of burning, but of yielding a gentle light, he said. And he adds, the pure fire within us is akin to this, and they, the gods, caused it to flow through the eyes. So when the intraocular fire reaches the light of day, it fuses with daylight to become a transparent medium for the, intermission, or the transmission of vision. Accordingly, whenever there is daylight roundabout, the visual current issues forth from the eye, like to like, and coalesces with it to form a single homogeneous body in a direct line with the eyes. So uh, you need both. You need the intraocular fire, which is allowing vision to pass outward through the eye, and you need daylight. And daylight then becomes the medium for this active vision to project sight. Uh, we come to Euclid now, and uh, he is the first great geometer. He's also the first one to give a theory of perspective. And when Euclid talks about perspective, he thinks of perspective as not this passive entry, but rather this active uh, way of measuring, we measure out the parallels here, and by measuring out these parallels, we're able to determine the perspective of something. And that is how he created his theory of perspective. In Euclid's Optica, rectilinear, which is to say straight rays of light, proceed from the eye in conical form to describe the object. The first of the seven postulates begins, let it be assumed, first, that the rectilinear rays proceeding from the eye diverge indefinitely. And by establishing that principle, he's able to establish the principle of perspective. So it goes on and on that up until the Middle Ages, we basically thought of vision as something active. And it was only during the Renaissance and until today that we see it as passive. William Blake, who is without a doubt one of the greatest visionaries of all time, uh, wrote in one of his manuscripts, this life's five windows of the soul, in five windows he means the five senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, distorts the heavens from pole to pole and leads you to believe a lie when you see with, not through, the eye. I think even from this drawing that you see here, that Blake had this idea that vision was indeed this active force. And that uh, especially if we are to open ourselves up to the divine eye, then uh, when we see, we are in a certain sense seeing the creation the way God sees the creation as something constantly actively being created rather than this object which is mysteriously evolving and passively throwing its sense objects towards us and we are passively receiving them. So if this is the case, if vision is indeed something that's active and as we actively see at the same time forms emerge to fill our field of vision, then certain basic shapes will play an important role. And I want to look at that now. If vision is the active creation, maybe it's the active creation of shape and form. So I'm pleased to present this slide, which has this beautiful work by Cuba Ambrose at the center uh, from a, the top part of a painting called The House of Many Mansions. 
And in it, he gives you this eye of God as this geometrical construction. And to be more precise, it's a triangle in a circle. And it's a triangle in a circle, which we could, if we wish, inscribe a square as well. And Alex Gray does very much the same thing. He inscribes the triangle in the circle. Whereas in my case, I inscribe the triangle in the square, which is then inscribed in the circle. Slight difference, but I think each artist should develop their own uh, trimorphic matrix suboculus to uh, guide their visions. There's no right or wrong here. So let's look at the circle, the triangle, and the square and ask ourselves how they shape our active vision. And I would argue that the circle gives us two primordial things in art, style and form. Style, what is style? If I look at this Egyptian profile, it is the profile of a woman. If Da Vinci was going to draw this profile of a woman, he'd do this beautiful curly hair and maybe some beautiful drapery falling down over here and so on. It would be very beautiful, but the Egyptian is very aware of simplifying and simplifying everything down to the most simple curves. And as he simplifies things down to the most simple curves, straight, round and so on, the face, even if it had many ridges and so on, everything gets simplified to a curve which echoes and resonates with the surrounding circle. That to me is style. Style is when we simplify to the essential. Style is when the curve does not have lots of jagged edges and so on, but rather is graceful and smooth. And any period of history, not just the Egyptian, is striving for the simplest, most graceful curves to render something like a face or a hand or the human figure. So that style, which comes from the circle. The other thing that comes from the circle, I argue, is form. And we can see this in Raphael's vision of St. Catherine. Volume. He, he, he has not even drawn a halo around her head. There is no halo here, but there might as well be because her head is so circular in its volume, so perfectly rendered, that you can feel the circle that goes around the head and you can feel another circle that brings the upper body together, the shoulders down, the breasts and so on, into this round curving shape. Not a perfect circle, more like an oblong, an egg or something, but that he's constantly coming back to the circular form to create, sorry, the, cir the circle itself to create the forms in his work, the volumes. And Raphael was really a master of that, I think. So as we actively see and create, we become aware of the circle and the influence of the circle on our vision. When we draw, we're actively creating. And so draw through the circle if you want. At the same time, your vision is going to pass through the diagonals. And what are the diagonal lines going to give us? Well, Traditionally in art, diagonal lines give us armature and they give us perspective. And in fact, these two can conflict with each other. They're both diagonals, but they serve different purposes. The, and, and remember, most of these lines are invisible, although occasionally the base of a column will give you a visible indication of that perspective line. But these are these invisible perspective lines in Da Vinci's famous uh, preparation for a painting, all converging to give the impression of space. Here, and we've seen this image before, uh, that these lines are being used to group the figures into triangles and harmoniously divide this three, uh, this three by four rectangle into certain harmonious points. 
armature, armature with diagonals, diagonals dividing up the space. Those are perhaps the two principal roles of diagonals in art. But let's think for a moment. Perceptually, when I look at this, these are two diagonals, what I see is space. Somehow, you know, when we look at this, we get the, we automatically convert that into perspective. Uh, meanwhile, when I use a diamond or a triangle, we have something that is more giving us a form and that the form will fit into this. This becomes, in a certain sense, the space of armature, the diamond. X becomes the space of perspective. They're both diagonals. And, is, and what eventually happens is that they all cross over each other and we see both organized forms in space. The last of the shapes, you know, the, the diagonals being the descendant of the triangle, well, the orthogonals are the descendant of the square. And the orthogonals are the verticals and horizontals. And we happen to live on a planet which has gravity. And because we have gravity, we have this vertical sense of architecture, balance, standing, and so on. We can't avoid it. Gravity gives us the vertical line. And so everywhere we turn, we get these vertical lines because of gravity. And we get these horizontal lines because when we look, we see the horizon and all these things are founded upon a flat horizontal ground. So uh, in art, when we talk about the vertical line, we talk about the plumb line. Yeah, the figure, the, the figure, sorry, the line of gravity that traverses the figure and creates balance. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, if we talk about the horizontal lines, we can talk about proportion. You know, we have talked about proportion in this course, right? Horizontal lines divide up the figure into specific proportional units. And horizontal lines give us, obviously, the horizon for architecture and everything else. So when you're making a painting, and here is perhaps one of my favorite paintings of all time, uh, Jupiter and Semele from Gustave Moreau, that your vision is actively putting together all these different things. That the circles are giving style and form to your figures. Here's Semele on the lap of Jupiter, right? And Semele is this beautiful, curving, feminine form. The story is that she asked for the God to reveal himself in his full glory. And he tried to resist her, but she made him promise, and so he did. He revealed himself in his full glory, and it was so powerful that the vision killed her. And everything that you see here, then, has to do with the afterlife journey through death and an eventual resurrection. Now, <clears throat> what you have happening in this painting is both style and form in the curving lines, but also armature and perspective in the diagonals. And you can maybe feel that there is certain armatures, diagonals at work creating, uh, organizing those shapes and forms. There's not much of a pr perspective, but there is armature in this work. And last of all, the squares, right, giving us proportion, giving us architecture all the way through. <clears throat> when you're creating a work of art, I think you should constantly be aware of those three shapes working together and informing your vision. But uh, if we're creating a hieratic work of art, a visionary work of art, then in a certain sense, uh, as we gaze upon the face of the divine figure, we gaze into the face of the divine, it gazes back at us. We are beholding the source of vision here. And as the source of vision, it is, in a certain sense, the source of each circle, the source of each diagonal, the source of each horizontal echoing outward 
in space to create uh, the drama, the unfolding, the, the, the painting itself. <clears throat> so that divine eye is creating the space in the painting. And certainly when a Buddhist artist paints the Buddha, he understands that, that he understands that the Buddha is in a certain sense creating the reality around itself. Uh, we in the West don't think in those terms so much, but perhaps we did and should once again. <clears throat> Gustave Moreau was also a master of ornament. He loved ornament and that comes out especially in this image here where uh, the god Jupiter has the winged scarab at, at the base here from which the uh, lily or lotus, the Egyptian lotus grows, and then you have other amazing jeweled elements, the, the lyre as symbol of harmony, this flame in the hands of the angel and so on. That, uh, and now let's descend a bit further down the figure. <clears throat> Shiva Lingam down here and we have seen examples of ornament, these perspectival, uh, sorry, uh, not perspectival but um, profiles, these profiles of uh, winged creatures here, the profiles of these horses and so on, creating heraldic and hieratic shapes all the way through uh, his composition even though you do have more humanist and active figures moving down through the composition. I'm just going to focus in on this little motif down here because it's interesting. Uh, about 200 meters from where I'm standing is the Schatzkammer here in Vienna. And this is a large ceremonial cloak that we be placed around the emperor and it's on display in the Schatzkammer. And Gustave Moreau has taken that motif pretty much exactly and reproduced it at the base of the throne of Jupiter in Jupiter and Semele. So he was, like Ernst Fuchs, very much aware of the source of a lot of his imagery and used it in a certain fashion because he was fascinated by the entire world, the symbolic and allegorical world of ornament. Moving to the last part of this lecture, part three, I would like to suggest that ornament is the place where we have the play of shape and form in space. And basically, uh, I want to talk about shape, I want to talk about form, and I want to talk about how these things move in space. <clears throat> I mentioned that I journeyed to India in 2003, and during that time I visited a lot of temples, but specifically the Kajaraho temples was where I had a momentary breakthrough, a revelation, an epiphany about uh, how Hindu sculpture shapes, f uses shapes to create the sculptural forms. And uh, meanwhile, at the same time, I was living in Paris, and I in fact lived in Paris for 15 years, and I would cycle past Notre Dame de Paris pretty much every day. I lived just around the corner from it, and often I would journey and look at uh, Gothic architecture. And when I went to India, it, I was seeing these Indian uh, architectural shapes and forms through the eyes of someone who had, was very well experienced with Gothic sculpture. And I started to find all these Hindu and Gothic parallels, which, as I said, I put into uh, Vishnu Christ avatar, this large drawing. Now, there's a whole language of ornament in these cultures, which we've only just begun to touch the surface of what all this stuff means. Um, here you have this architectural motif, uh, probably very similar to the gargoyle in uh, French culture, 
spewing out something, right? The gargoyle is used to spew out the water that falls from the roof, but yes, that's its functional purpose. What's its symbolic purpose? What does that symbolize? What is this spewing out that goes on from these figures, and what are they spewing out? And no one really knows. There's no texts that explain these things. These are images that have come down to us through time. So uh, perhaps, you know, in the Hindu worldview, everything that we see is Maya, everything that we see is uh, an illusion shaped by uh, our thoughts. And so maybe this is showing us the illusion of creation. Or these are the waters that are the fertile source of all growth and all vegetation. We just don't know. But the motif recurs and recurs uh, throughout Hindu and Gothic sculpture. And then from Hindu, it moves into Tibetan and various forms of Thai and Vietnamese and so on architecture as well. Um, and the Gothic also moved outward from Europe across the West. <clears throat> Here you can see that this figure on the corner is spewing out something which is moving in this watery, vegetal kind of shape. Uh, in Hindu, it does have a name, the Makara, right? And the Makara is also spewing out. Sometimes there's jewels uh, in the watery shapes and forms. Now. The Makara is an interesting one, and I ended up reproducing one over here on the belt of Vishnu Christ. And as I looked at it and looked at it, it occurred to me that you see a face in profile over here as if gazing off in this direction, and another face in profile over here gazing off in that direction. But if you put those two faces together, you end up with this one face in profile, and that's kind of what you're seeing. You're seeing a single face in the frontal view, sorry, in the frontal view, created by two faces in profile. <clears throat> and as I was journeying through Kajaraho and the temples that are there, I came across this and photographed it because suddenly I felt, ah, I'm seeing not just the face, I'm seeing the entire body of this creature. And sure enough, the body was a lionine shape on one side, a lionine shape on the other side, and they're coming together and forming one face. Now, it struck me as being something fairly interesting and unique. When I got back to France and started researching these things, I discovered that sure enough, in uh, Gothic architecture, they have the same motif. And that you have here, for example, two lions, very heraldic, with one common face. Uh, or here, a common face with two lions. Here is perhaps even a better example where uh, we come very close to this uh, Makara concept. In Gothic culture, they even used it on the corner of certain blocks. That when you stood, you would see this face in profile because you're on that side of the block. And as you walk around, you would see the face in profile on this side of the block. But if you stood and stared at the block from the corner, you would see the face as one face created by two profiles. <clears throat> And then one day, I was walking in the Cluny Museum in Paris, which is just around the corner, practically, from Notre Dame. And I came across this small ivory carving. It's only a few centimeters large. It's very, very small. And it shows the bull of St. Luke. Each of the four evangelists had a representational animal, the eagle, the angel, the lion, and the bull. And here's the bull of St. Luke. And it has some peculiar quality about it. <clears throat> it seems to resemble this idea of the Makara, but in a certain sense, it doesn't. And it doesn't because these are using horizontal representations of the face and bringing them together. Where I, was, I would argue that it's not exactly a horizontal representation of the face, it's more of a vertical representation of the face. And 
I sat there and tried to puzzle this thing out and what the artist was actually thinking when he was creating this shape. It, it is curious if you go back, there is like a little prick mark in the center over here, which he may have used to create that circle over there. <clears throat> and from that prick mark, uh, if you draw down two diagonals, you get a certain sense of uh, the division, the line that was necessary to wrap this form around that line. You see what I'm saying? So that what you're ultimately beholding is a face in profile but vertically, another face in profile but vertically, and these two profiles put together and blended down the center to create that face. It's a real play of your imagination uh, how he was able to move all these different elements together to create that face. <clears throat> Once I got that principle, I started to think, ah, this is interesting. I can, I can work with this. I can play with this. So in the, when I had reached this part of Vishnu Christ avatar, I decided to put the four beasts of the evangelists uh, on this uh, lintel over here. And uh, basically, uh, this is the bull of St. Luke, which uh, we saw an example just now. Marcus, or St. Mark has the lion, uh, John has the eagle, and uh, this is the angel. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, this is from Matthew. <clears throat> what I did was play with those shapes in a way that was very much informed by what I had learned. That the makara seems to take uh, two profiles and combine them into one central face. And that what I, that's what I was doing, giving this third eye at the top as kind of the unifying element to bring together those aspects of the face. But the idea was to move off into basically a profile. And that's, you see that more clearly perhaps in the lion. With these two, I was trying something different. I wanted one half of the face to go off into a total profile, while the other half of the face came and we viewed it from the frontal view. So that this half was viewed from the front and this extended outward towards the profile, distorting it. Uh, later, as I was looking at this beautiful painting by Ernst Fuchs, I became intrigued by these two bird-like creatures at the top of his very interesting vision tree, or I don't know what to call it. He calls it a tree of paradise. <clears throat> and so if you look at this face, here of this one bird and this face over here, this other bird, and you kind of zoom in a little bit, which is what we'll do. You become intrigued, yeah? Is he following these same principles? Is he just equally, which, you know, I didn't invent those principles. He didn't invent those principles. They seem to go as far back as Hindu and Gothic sculpture, that they are principles that have been existing for all time. Working with the block, Right? There's like a block-like structure here. You work with the block. And where the block hits the corner, that's where the eye wraps around the corner of the block. And then establishing that idea, you know, this goes off into the profile. That one becomes either the other side of the block or maybe frontal. Um, this painting is in the Fuchs Villa. We saw it just uh, last weekend. If you zoom into the face of Adam over here and you ask yourself, what's going on here? Why is this eye elongated so far off to one side? <clears throat> is it just coincidence or is he actually thinking to himself, ah, let's create this side as much as possible from the frontal view. Let's push this one out to the profile as far as it'll go. And. Uh, I'm someone who's become intrigued by the sacred codes underlying the construction of uh, faces and figures from all cultures. And in my readings, I came across this Byzantine construction for the face, where it's highly suggested that you place 
one point of the compass on the eye, and with that you draw a circle. And then on the circumference of that circle, you place the compass again, and you draw the vesica piscis, another circle. And from the outline, then, you extend your compass, and you draw the next circle to get the uh, basic shape of the head. And this is the way Byzantine artists created the three-quarter view in their work. Now, the result, and it seems to be coincidental, but the result is that this side of the face ends up expanding outward into almost like a profile view, while this side of the face becomes more of a frontal view. <clears throat> These principles can be multiplied, and I'm encouraging you to play with form, to actively see form through different shapes and different angles, and the multiple ways that we can view form. <clears throat> This is also in the Fuchs Villa. It's kind of a drawing uh, with blue chalk uh, highlighted, I think, with ink. And at the very bottom down here, you get this motif, which I photographed because it just struck me. Ah, what is he doing here? And obviously, you have a skull. But how are we viewing this skull? And it's almost as if I was standing and drawing the skull from one side, and then came over here, drew the skull from this side, then walked on the other side and drew the skull from that side and projected it outward, right? And <clears throat> which is pretty much the same to what was happening over here, although I wasn't quite aware of it. If you think of that as a principle for drawing, where you're trying to pull out the volume as much as possible, ignoring perspective, ignoring the lines of perspective, and instead focusing on the volume itself. And then you start to look at drawings by da Vinci and Michelangelo, and for some reason these drawings always stuck in my head. This is one by da Vinci over here, and this one by Michelangelo over here, which is actually just part of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And they seem to be pulling out the face in numerous directions at once. And by doing that, they manage to increase the volume of things. And I would argue that when you want to create a face that has a certain kind of epic proportion or an epic volume, then you, you widen it. And as you widen it, it acquires that quality of monumentality. You're viewing it from the sides and the front simultaneously. Now, let's find another example by Michelangelo, which is this one, the, the Christ uh, at the center of the Last Judgment. And I've always wondered about this torso and how it seems to be so voluminous. And then it occurred to me, well, perhaps he is viewing this torso from the front and then moving a bit to the side and drawing it again from this side and then moving around to the other side and drawing it from that side so as to create this bulge, this, this extreme volume in space. And there's no other way to kind of explain that quality which Michelangelo's drawings have. But they definitely seem to resemble something. And then you look at these Babylonian stele where the figures are also with this widened, monumental quality, right? Which is what I would call a hieratic, uh, an aspect of the hieratic style, to, to widen, to progressively widen something, to make it uh, somehow uh, filling us with wonder, filling us with awe. <clears throat> This is a close-up which I took of uh, one of the figures from the Apocalypse Chapel in Klagenfurt. And uh, I could even see that as Ernst Fuchs was painting this over time, he progressively widened and widened the face, trying to give it that monumental quality. <clears throat> and it definitely has that. It has that quality of looking at something big. Okay, thank you very much for listening, and that's the end of today's lecture.